Marius Henriksen and Christian Barton. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Jared. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So we've got Marius over in Copenhagen, Denmark, and we've got Christian down in Melbourne, Victoria. Two of these cities are the most livable cities in the world. So you're, you're going all right. You're putting me to shame up here in uh, dodgy Queensland. So <laughs> respect. So fellas, before we get into the, into the show, I want you both to really briefly introduce yourselves. I'm sure uh, listeners know who you are, but Marius, let's start with you. Who are you? What do you do, mate? Well, my name is Marius Henriksen, and I'm a clinical professor of physical therapy here at the University of Copenhagen. And I'm based at something called the Parker Institute, that is a clinical research institute at the Copenhagen University Hospital. And we have a variety of focuses, but I'm mainly focused on musculoskeletal pain, mainly osteoarthritis pain, and uh, how we can manage that in a non-surgical way. So uh, that's that's uh, exercise, weight loss, and pharmaceuticals, basically. Um, so I conduct and design a lot of clinical trials and have my PhD student and, and uh, postgraduate students. That's my main... Um, my main line of work and i've been doing this for the last 20 years not as a, not as a professor but uh in in this research area yeah are you are you a physio by trade maris i'm a physio by training yes um graduated many years ago now but uh seems like yesterday <laughs> cool are oh, you still look young and vibrant uh, christian what oh, about thanks. you mate <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm a clinician researcher, so physio background, um, practiced and completed research um, together for the last oh, 15 plus years. And most of my clinical practice and research align, so looking at persistent knee pain, so from younger people, adolescents, patellofemoral pain through to older populations with knee osteoarthritis. Uh, clinically, I really like seeing running injuries, in particular people with knee osteoarthritis wanting to continue running or get back to running. Um, it's harder to get research funding for running-related research, um, but I like to do that clinically. Uh, in my research program, I started off doing a lot of biomechanics research in a gate lab, 3D motion analysis, and then slowly transitioned um, through my interest in behavior change and implementation more towards implementation science and do a lot of qualitative research these days and, and run more knowledge translation research programs related particularly to knee osteoarthritis but also dabble in oncology rehab and low back pain plantar heel pain various other musculoskeletal conditions tendinopathy etc awesome busy both busy so i want to ask you uh, both a personal question because just to, and i haven't this is unscripted so this is just come to me because i want people to figure out who you guys are apart from your intellectual and professional jobs what do you do for fun marius what's your what's your what's your hobbies what do you like to do I love to cook and eat, um, and I cook and, and eat. Uh, that, cook and eat, yeah. So, so that needs uh, to be um, very, very delicately dosed, unless you want to <laughs> have a larger version of me. Um, and then uh, I love to go by the ocean and and on the ocean. I'm a windsurfer, so um, cool. yeah, yeah. Awesome, Christian. Yeah, so I'd probably have a pretty strong obsession with football, Australian rules football for those international and even new in Queensland, Jared, the, where we actually do kick the ball and don't throw it around. Um, so played up until a few years ago and now I've got three young kids who are all obsessed with it. So going along to watch it and also playing with them. Probably activity-wise, do more running these days, although I am flirting with the idea of making a comeback to footy. But um, yeah, running, I've got a seven-year-old who's got a park run PB, so 5Ks of just over 23 minutes. So he's suddenly wow. putting pressure in me to to try and pick up my running and I think if I go back 18 months two years ago he would have beaten me um and so now my my goal at the moment physical activity wise just to stay fast in for as long as I can that's awesome 5k 23 minutes that's seriously impressive yeah he's a, a fast little fella obviously gets it from his mum right Oh, it's not me. I've got some great genes <laughs> in my family of uh, running. Uh, uncles who won races at stall and things like that in some of the yeah, right. two miles. I inherited yeah. none of them. Zero. <laughs> it's skip, the skip, skip the generation. Yeah, that's right. All right, sweet. So now we've got a little bit of uh, humanity in the show. So let's get into the to the nitty gritty. So Marius, you've you've been a driving force and a, and a lead author in this this disco trial, which has come out, which which has taken the physio world by storm and caused a lot of Twitter debates. And I love it. It's caused a lot of lively discussion. So thank you for doing the work. Um, I want you to, I want you to just 
give us a little bit of a summary of the trial, if you don't mind. Um, and then maybe I'll get Christian to sort of butt in and he can sort of speak for Glad, but maybe uh, Marius, just give us a little bit of a, an overview of what the trial is and what it found. Yes, of course. Sorry, my, my office phone just rang, so I just have to take it off here. Uh, well, the DISCO trial was a trial that we had in mind for many years because we started to, to think a little bit critical about the, the true effect of, of um, exercise in general, and particularly the exercise part that was uh, promoted as part of the GLAD program. Uh, after we have, we have worked a bit with it ourselves and kind of struggled to see um, to, to see the rationale and, and to, to, uh, to accept that this would be um, uh, an effective uh, intervention. Um, and then we discussed how, how could we do a study that uh, kind of overcame some of the challenges with exercise trials were in osteoarthritis with, with pain as an outcome, because we have a problem with designing a proper control group and blinding uh, exercise. So, so go, going at it scientifically, we have a problem uh, in, in our field of physiotherapy and exercise, therapeutic exercise. And then we came up with um, the idea that let's, let's control it against something uh, that is normally used as a placebo in pharmaceutical trials. And that was the saline injections. Um, and uh, after a bit of forth and back with the uh, ethical committees and uh, funding bodies, uh, we, we uh, set off and designed a study where we aimed to see if if the effects of the GLAD program was would be equivalent to that of the comparators, so the saline injections, um, and we did that after a voting in the in the research group. So we actually voted who who thinks will who 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 will win, and we asked all the investigators, and it panned out that it was it was a tie. Uh, equally, many investigators voted for the GLAD program as uh, for the for the saline injection and as for no difference. And then we uh, decided to go with the equivalent study because that's what the the prevailing, or not prevailing, but that's what the hypothesis, that we, we couldn't agree to to agree. So we agreed to disagree. And then we went for the for the test and design of the studies uh, that, that uh, aimed at look, showing that they were equally good. And um, then we included 200 patients and uh, randomized them to the GLAD program and to the saline injections. And it panned out that they were equally good at relieving pain. Um, and that has caused a, a bit of controversies and debates um, also on Twitter, but uh, around the world. And, and uh, well, here we are to, uh, to pick that up. Good, there's lots to dive into. Christian, I want you to just give us a bit of an intro into Glad, Mar Marius said it a few times, but what's this Glad program that we keep hearing about? Yeah, I might before I jump into Glad, I'll I guess go to the rationale of the trial and just thinking about that. And I think Marius put together and his team put together a really good protocol and would have been quite a compelling funding argument. Um, if you look at intra-articular saline injections, which was the control. If you compare that to no intervention, the effect size is about 0.7 across a number of trials, which was very clear in, in the protocol they put in. And interestingly, if you compare exercise to no intervention, then you see about the same, about 0.7. So these are both reasonable effect sizes compared to just leaving people by themselves. Um, so we, I'm sure we'll touch on saline and what we do with the considerations around that later. But it, if you go back to that common principle around exercise being better than no intervention, I guess that's probably where GLAD emanates from. And we know from some of the work we've done in systematic reviews more recently that if you combine exercise with quality education, that that can also improve outcomes, particularly in the short term for both pain and function. And that's what informs guidelines of why guidelines widely recommend exercise and education. Now, we know that if you look at trials that try to compare different forms of exercise, they rarely find a difference between interventions of exercise. Um, and that can be high dose resistance training versus lower dose resistance training. And when I talk about dose, I'm talking more about the magnitude of loads, et cetera, not necessarily how much exercise people do. 
If you compare aerobic exercise to resistance training compared to exercise that might focus on function, you'll rarely find a difference. So it seems that although not all exercise is equal, if you do it across a population base, that exercise seems to win against usual care or against no intervention. And if you look at some of the trials that looked at cost effectiveness and thinking about measurements like health related quality of life which is probably what we need to really consider as physios it's really clear that it's beneficial as well and, and cost effective um, over a couple of years in these trials so the purpose of glad i guess emanated from denmark and we were inspired at latrobe by what that managed to do in terms of we see huge variation in what physios provide in clinical practice some really good physios and some really good education and exercise interventions and others won't provide any exercise, a lot of passive treatment um, and a lot of dependence relationships developing. And so we looked at GLAD as an implementation vehicle and we played around with it to see if we could try and get it to happen here in Australia. And to talk about what GLAD is, I think people get very caught up on the type of exercise. Um, we all have our biases as physios and one of the greatest things GLAD did to me was actually got me to challenge my bias around what I thought was the best exercise program. I now have some much better understanding that I was probably had a lot of biases that have now been tested and proven wrong in other trials and also experience with GLAD. But essentially what it does is it provides support and a framework for training physiotherapists to implement what is guideline-based care. So ensuring they have some skills and also some resources to go back to their clinic and deliver an intervention that's a bit more standardized. And we don't typically see that. Um, and then it's also got a registry behind it. So we can actually evaluate outcomes in the real world. And that's what really excites me as a researcher is we can start to look at uh, which people or which populations of this program benefit most and which are the populations that we probably need to not give the program to. And we all have our biases about what we think that is and well, I think what's exciting about GLAD, and we're starting to look at some of this in our registry in Australia because we have more than 15,000 people, there are certainly populations who the program might not benefit, but there are equally populations who the program benefits a lot. And so it goes back to what is GLAD. It's really training, support of physiotherapists, deliver a guideline-based care, and then it's evaluation of that as we go along, which is quite unique and rare within physio practice. But I'm sure we can talk about the specifics of the program a bit more as well, but that's the, the principles of it. Lovely. Uh, Marius, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, uh, Christian uh, nicely uh, summarized some of the very good things about the GLAD program, namely that it is um, in, that it is a standardized framework. What I, what we've been struggling with is more the contents that, um, that needs to be debated because, uh, as Christian said, from, from various uh, systematic reviews and, and overviews of, of the evidence, it's not possible to distinguish the effects on knee osteoarthritis pain from various types of exercises. So a strength training in various doses or aerobic or, or so to speak. So, so our problem is that the, the promoted exercise program in the GLAD has never been tested in a randomized control trial. So they state that it is evidence-based because all exercises is supposed to be equally good, but the neuromuscular exercise program has never been put into a randomized control trial. And that's been promoted in, in, in the GLAD program as being evidence-based. And that's where we kind of think, well, not that evidence-based. So, Marius, if I ask you a question, thinking about your belief of the program, and clearly you've got criticisms of the content of the exercise program, otherwise you probably wouldn't go down the lines of this trial. I'll ask you two questions. One is, what do you consider that's likely to be inferior of that program compared to others and two is if you compared it to no intervention like many other exercise trials like resistance training aerobic training do you believe it would come out as not being superior to no intervention if that trial was done and why didn't you do that trial sorry putting three there well well we did that we did that trial but we did it after the glad was promoted uh, so we did a the neuromuscular exercise program against no, no intervention and it came out uh, well, along the lines with uh, many other studies, uh, a minor, small, small, small effects. Um, we did it uh, a little bit more intensive than what is promoted in the GLAD. So we did it three times per week for, for 12 weeks. Uh, and in the GLAD, is, they decided to do two times per week for six weeks. Uh, so, so there's a difference in the dosage uh, that might uh, explain that. So, so and from our clinical uh, expertise, I mean, the, the neuromuscular exercise program that is that is being used in the GLAD program is uh, designed originally in Sweden for very, very severely uh, uh, affected knee osteoarthritis patients. Uh, and then putting that into a perspective of a very heterogeneous population with 
where we have uh, young people being 55 and still working on scaffolds or or bricklayers or something like that uh, that are strong and 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 get fit from their work I mean, it, it it's it's completely uh, in my view uh, off off the chart and and uh, i mean uh, it's not it's not relevant for them and and they 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 kind of look at me and say you want me to do this eh, no thanks um so so that's that's some of the criticisms and and then uh, I mean, you know, all, we all agree that patient education is, is important, but, uh, but we have never really looked into the content of the patient education. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. it, might, it may be patient education per se is evidence-based, but the content has never been uh, really explored. And I forgot all your questions. But, uh, That's right. let's, let's go back to patient education. If I go a, a little bit further around that, I guess, what do you feel the neuromuscular exercise program providing GLAD is missing? So go back to your bricklayer. What is it missing? What doesn't it address? Well, uh, the, the, the premise of, of the neuromuscular exercise program is that um, the patients somehow are moving around in a wrong way and the physio has the, the solution that I know how, to, how you should move. And that is a very orthopedic and biomechanical approach. Um, and uh, based on uh, studies that we did, we did biomechanical anal gait analysis on, on uh, before and after our neuromuscular exercise program for 12 weeks, three times per week. So a higher dose that presumably should be as effective as anything. And we couldn't find any changes in the biomechanics at all. Um, so, uh, so it misses uh, an another perspective on, of the disease, uh, for instance, cardio cardiometabolic aspects. Uh, that is not uh, been targeted at all. Yeah. So if if we go back to that concept around physios being able to identify the wrong movement pattern and correcting, I, I tend to agree with you, Marius, and we have interesting discussions within the international GLAD leadership around this. And we know that the program, if you focus on some movement pattern and control and try to improve that, it can be very helpful for some people. The way we teach the course in Australia, um, and it's evolved all around the world towards this alignment is that you don't have to move a perfect way necessarily. This is an option you have to move differently that can be a pain modifier and can reduce pain. But ultimately what the exercises do is they improve your your control and, and your confidence to actually engage in exercise. And so some of the outcomes that we look at in our Australian registry are around that, not just control, but thinking more so about confidence to engage and load the knee, confidence to engage and load the hip and fear of damaging the joint. And what we see is some really big changes with that. I think one of the big tricks you missed in your trial was actually evaluating any self-efficacy outcomes and, and anything in relation to that, because what we do know from our recent research around mediation analysis, that seems to mediate outcomes. The other thing that's a misnomer around the world thinking about GLAD is that they think most people who haven't maybe done the training and be supported, um, at least in Australia anyway, to deliver the program is they believe that's all the focus is, but actually the focus is around graded exposure. The focus is also around resistance training to improve capacity of your knee. So quadriceps, hamstrings, resistance training to improve capacity around your hip, resistance training to improve capacity around your trunk. And you'll notice, Jared, I didn't say core stability there. That was a fun one to change the terminology of in Australia when we went through it. So there, there's lots more to the program from an exercise perspective than just that neuromuscular focus and control. And I think that's often missed in translation, especially in social media debates. And there's this dichotomy that, okay, it's all just about this, but actually the program's broader than that. And I think that's important. The other thing I will pull you up on is that a bricklayer can't benefit from it. Now, I have plenty of tradespeople that come through the clinic here who absolutely love the program and benefit a lot from it. And the key is the program is designed and encouraged to be individualized and clinicians are encouraged to do that. So if someone needs additional resistance training, then they should provide that. If someone needs some um, calf strength because that's part of their function they need to recover, then it's a minimal intervention. So these things can be added. Um, so it's not a one size fits all and this is a structured approach. And I guess... If I follow that up with a question, I'd be very curious about how you monitored what was delivered in the exercise intervention in your study. Because if I look at the outcomes and the best comparison I can make is Coos quality of life, your Coos quality of life changes in both the saline group and in your GLAD group were quite low, both at three months and particularly at 12 months when we make comparisons to GLAD registry. So I guess the question to you is, what did you monitor in terms of that side of things with your trial? What, what was being provided and what was actually being progressed and how are those progressions done? Did you look at the fidelity of those types of things or did you just leave it to the physios and hope for the best? 
Well, uh, we did monitor the uh, the progression, and we had a, a pre-specified uh, progression scheme. So, so, uh, so that's one of the main differences between uh, putting a program like LAD or, or neuromuscular exercises into a trial versus putting it out in the real world. Uh, because I agree that that it is individualized, uh, and probably. When people come and say, "Well, your effect in in the disco trial is much lower than what we see in the in the registries," that is because in the the people in the registries, the co-interventions are so prevalent. I should say, you can get something else. You can get a bit of mobilization or a laser or uh, come an extra time or uh, I'll give you another exercise. So we took what is protocolized and described in the GLAD program and tested that. So, so, uh, so, so, uh, so, screaming that we are underestimating the effects. Well, yes, we are, but we are only testing what is being protocolized yeah. and not what uh, what the physios uh, feel that they should give. And why do they give anything else? Is that because they kind of get embarrassed or and see, well, this is not enough for you. You have to get something else, and then then it's not glad anymore. I mean, and then, then it gets. It becomes very dependent on on your own physio, and then the, the the equity of providing equal care for everybody is kind of ruined because it becomes dependent on your on your physio. Yeah, the majority of people, at least in Australia, I can only speak from the Australian experience. The majority of people doing Glad don't get a lot of additional things, so they get additional progressions and tailoring of their exercise program but they don't necessarily got a lot of additional other treatments. So you mentioned laser therapy. Laser therapy is almost never done in Australia that I see amongst physios. Um, they may teach some taping as part of the process, maybe very occasional manual therapy. We very much promote to not let that get in the way of exercise. And most clinicians primarily deliver the exercise. The key part is it's individualized to the person. And I guess I go back to my question and I'd be curious and listeners would be, how did you, I guess, allow the physios to progress exercises appropriately because you mentioned your bricklayer before and the program can absolutely progress be progressed for that person the program can be progressed for an elite athlete if you actually have a goal the program has some really high level exercise and i'd challenge anyone out there to do there's le four levels of exercises i'd challenge anyone out there to be able to do all four levels it's pretty tricky and pretty challenging so i just go back to the outcomes of coos quality of life and your changes i think of around eight at three months and then back to around four or five at 12 months, they're so, so low. So it makes me question what was actually provided in that program that you had in the trial. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot really answer anything that uh, the, we provided what was described in the GLAD program that was brought home from the, from the courses. Uh, this is the program. This is, this is how you would progress. This, these are the slides and for the, inter, for the so, so, so uh, just to I just guess. to touch, touch on that, Marius, um, it sounds like you tried to control some of that. You had a very structured framework around how things would progress. So perhaps it wasn't exactly what the training was to do. I guess I have one other really important question that always baffled me. I always have two important questions that always baffled me. One being, was there any invitation from someone from GLAD to collaborate on the trial? So Soren or Eva or someone else so that we could consider some of these questions that might come up later. And the second one is, I guess trying to replicate some of the outcome measures in the GLAD registry, looking at things beyond pain, which we know we weren't going to see a difference in pain between saline and exercise. We knew that from the other trials, but thinking about things like joint related confidence a bit more, thinking about things like self efficacy, thinking about health related quality of life, going back to what I'm point I made before, that's a really key outcome. So, yeah, collaboration invitations or consideration around the broader outcome measures in the program. Well, we had a we didn't uh, in, exactly invite uh, the GLAD people into the program, but we were in contact with them, asking them uh, if we could get some elaborations on the program or if we could do this and how is it done. And then we had uh, GLAD certified people um, working on on delivering the GLAD program, um, but no uh, no uh, direct involvement from the GLAD, uh, which is. Uh, uh, I consider a strength because then this research is independent uh, of GLAD, so so no biases in terms of, of uh, preconception or or yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I agree. You can consider it a strength, but I think it also probably brought up some weaknesses in the end around that broader outcome measure consideration. Also, probably potentially going back to the results and the findings, maybe brought up some reasons of why you maybe had lower lower changes in in some of the outcome measures that are used. And I I really am still baffled about the the changes there. Um, the other question. I mean, I mean, in terms of the outcome measures, we chose the uh, 
The core outcome measures are set by the OMRAC Rousies, which are the international uh, uh, associations for the study of osteoarthritis. Uh, so we took the core outcomes from that, which is pain, uh, function, uh, and patient global assessment, uh, and have quality of life. Uh, so, um, yeah. But not I don't know uh, if, 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 GLAD, if the GLAD people could have used uh, or added anything, uh, other outcomes that, that are considered important by the patients. Yeah, I'd say that's an interesting consideration. We've done some focus group focus focus groups recently with knee osteoarthritis patients, and what we do in GLAD and what is in the OMRAC Dorsey criteria, none of them really resonate with people with OA. But that's a whole other story that maybe we can talk about another time. But we we don't measure things very well at all, um, based on patient perspectives. Um, so if you, one of the things that you made mention of is around co-interventions in GLAD as a minimal intervention. So I guess to follow up a question with you around that, you have your, your three month outcomes, which in theory, you've got two interventions that you're comparing. Beyond that, there wasn't really any control around co-interventions. And if you look at the co-interventions, there's sort of an equal number of people in the GLAD group and the saline group doing exercise, an equal number having injections, an equal number having all these varying other things. So what can we make of the 12 month outcomes if we've got such variation in co-interventions? Well, uh, the interesting thing is that the, the effect is quite stable, uh, small, but very stable, both for the, uh, for the injections and for, for, the, for the GLAD. Um, and one of the important aspects of GLAD is that they state that you should consider to, to continue exercise. That is a, an important, uh, message that people that are going to the GLAD are, are, are sent off with. Uh, and in our population, uh, they were not really sticking to the exercises at least. Um, I'm not sure I can, I've seen any re uh, reports from the GLAD registry about how, how often people continue exercising. Um, so at least uh, perhaps we, we could consider that uh, uh, an eight week intervention is probably not sufficient to, to, uh, to make the behavior change needed for, for people to continue exercise. I, I agree. Irrespective, irrespective of it's glad or whatever, uh, that's too short. I mean, we can, we can look at, at smoking cessation or weight loss. I mean, eight weeks intervention and then believing that people are capable of doing that on their own. Nah, not really. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with you there. I think there's, we don't have exact data on this, but there is a, a group and a cohort does continue to do this independently, um, especially when the program's delivered well and that independence is promoted by clinicians. One of our frustrations around fidelity, and, and I think it's really important to be open about this in Australia, is we have some clinicians who try to provide the program using gym equipment, for example. We've had a really wacky experience where we had to pull up a clinic who tried to set up GLAD plus using Pilates equipment. That was fun. Um, so we have to monitor this fidelity. And one of the challenges when clinicians deliver it really well, we tend to find patients are able to do it independently, um, which is, again, interesting from your study that not many people seem to do that. Um, I think if we looked at it properly with clinicians delivering the program, well, I think we'd see a higher rate of ongoing exercise. Um, if clinicians deliver it poorly, we probably see rates similar to what you saw in your trial. But we need to look at this a little bit more. It's a, it's a really good point around the short intervention and whether it achieves behavior change. Sorry, Jared, I keep asking questions. You might have more. No, you're right, Marius. Did you want to add anything there? No, that's fine. I think um, I think I, I agree on on Christian's last point here. Cool. So, Mario, so we'll just let you sort of finish off with the uh, with the maybe discussion and the results a little bit more. I think we can kind of infer what the results were, but the the too long didn't read of it is that a saline injection or multiple saline injections were effectively equivalent to eight weeks of GLAD exercise. And so a really big question that comes out of this, this is, is this the, is this the first trial in knee osteoarthritis that has used saline injections as a control group? Uh, it's the first trial in, in, in exercise, uh, in non-pharmacological. Yeah. So we, we kind of mix the, the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological things here. And that's some of the, that's what makes the, the, the study a little bit tricky to, uh, to, to, to break down um, mm. because that's one of the major um, limitations is, is that the two interventions is, is so fundamentally different. Yeah, so let's, so, let's, so let's get into that. A lot of people are talking about, you know, how do we compare saline injections to exercise, which are fundamentally different beasts when it comes to perhaps causal mechanisms un underpinning so, 
So how did you come to sort of using saline injections for the control group? Um, do you think that that's an appropriate control group going forward? And what does it give us in terms of a comparison? Like what, what, what's the clinician take home when comparing exercise to saline injections? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that there, the, the, there's a, a direct clinical implication for the, for the exercise community, at least, because of, 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 the, of the choice of comparison of the saline injections. But the, at least it, 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 we have succeeded in, in starting a debate that was kind of absent for many years about uh, the, the true mechanisms of exercise when we talk about pain relief. Um, and uh, and the, this debate is very sound and, and with the recent uh, review coming out, uh, even uh, with even more discouraging uh, results from, from, uh, from the Kiel University, uh, I think the, it's very timely that we pick up this debate um and and try to to see if if exercise actually does have an effect on knee pain or not uh, this is not the same and we should not exercise or not so so going into recommendations and and and, and talking about if exercise is good for you or not that's an, uh, that's another discussion that we can pick up later um and then uh, regarding the the choice of 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 saline as a, as a comparator that was based on that that uh, we have a lot of rheumatologists working here and they, and they use saline as comparators and say well that is a very a very good uh, comparator when we do intraarticular uh, injection studies so if you want to test the effect of corticosteroids or hyaluronic acid saline injections is uh, is the is the is a good placebo and then we were inspired by some of the work that's been doing in open label placebo, which is a, a, a field of studies where you give patients with whatever they have of disease, an inert treatment. So, so a sugar pill or a saline shot or something and say, well, this is placebo, but mind body things, things are going on and it, we, it's sure, we are sure that this will help you. And it, and it actually is quite effective. And then we just said, well, we might overcome some of the attention bias uh, in, in the studies by doing this, knowing and accepting that there are huge differences in the route of delivery of, of exercise and saline injection. Christian? I think the saline injection part is fascinating. Um, as, as we mentioned before, like, and again, I go back to the protocol that Marius and his team put together. Like if you compare saline to nothing, it's, it's effective. It, it does reduce pain. It's a very powerful placebo. I think it's probably not inert. There probably is an active ingredient in having some extra fluid injected into the joint. And that may be why we see potential improvements with PRP compared to no intervention, why we see potential improvements, a whole range of different injections compared to no intervention. So we don't really know the mechanism of why saline achieves what it achieves. Like we don't know the mechanism of why exercise achieves what, what it achieves. So what do we do with this trial in clinical practice is a really interesting question. I don't think it really changes anything um, because I don't think the study was set up to really ask to me as a clinician, a question that was going to change my practice. Um, it was set up to, to test, glad against a different intervention um, that was a placebo, but I don't know that actually tells us much because we don't have saline injections available. Maybe an interesting trial next would be to try and think more carefully about a control intervention for exercise um, and different types of exercise to try and tease out the active ingredients. And there was a really nice one done recently looking at heavy resistance training compared to lower resistance training. That was a great trial, showed there was no difference in outcomes. That's a great use of research resources if we think about saline i'd love to see a sham saline injection trial so saline injection compared to i don't know maybe we do what we do in acupuncture trials and use toothpicks and pretend we've done it or maybe we stick the needle in but don't inject any fluid in and, and compare that that would be a really useful trial so if i think again i'll go back to the trial i'm not sure what clinical question it answered i'd probably look at some of those trials instead of, of that would be my thought and i think one of the questions that people ask is would you prescribed saline i probably would if it was available um because i think it's a powerful pain reduction and i think when we send people off for a synvisc or send them off for a prp we're probably essentially just augmenting a really powerful placebo Marius. yeah i mean in our clinic uh the medical doctors have taken the consequence of our research and are offering saline injections awesome that's cool uh, 
so so uh, and and it's done uh, completely open and uh, patients patients love it um, and that's also some of the experiences we had from from doing the trial uh, I mean it was open label and and people say some yeah. were really amazed that this this shot really uh, was so effective yeah we have we have um, some sports physicians here in Melbourne that will just inject whole blood because you probably get the same effect as doing a PRP injection, for example. That, that's great, Maris. I really, it'd be great to see them spread this. Yeah, and, and with, with osteoarthritis of the knee, that is a disease that we don't really know. We don't really know what's going on. Uh, we don't really have anything that is really effective. And, and uh, I, think I, think, I think it's important for the physicians and for the physios, for, so let's say, to first do no harm. So give an uh, intervention that is associated with the lowest amount of side effects. Uh, and saline injection is, at least in uh, what we can see, very, have very few side effects attached with it. Um, so, uh, so why not go that way? I mean, but that's not, I'm a physio, I'm not gonna interfere with what, what, the, what, the, med what the physicians are gonna do, uh, not gonna do, but uh, at least I, I can say that in the clinic we run, it is now uh, being offered to select patients. Marius, are you saying that you think that saline, open label salt water injection should be a mainstream treatment for keen people for knee osteoarthritis? Uh, yes, I really think so. Um, because it's cheap. Uh, there's no... Uh, there's no financial incentives from anyone. I mean, there's not a company producing um, saline or that has a patent of saline. Um, and I'm going to safe. register one tonight, actually. Yeah, I mean, you could do uh, some <laughs> some special, uh, special South Pole saline or something like that from uh, from the South Seas and say, well, this is. I mean, and then we are in uh, then we are in the physio business again. <laughs> <laughs> If there's not a naturopath that hasn't hasn't done that, then I, I would be gobsmacked because they've got all sorts of remedies. Anyway, yeah. So so um, yeah, I actually believe that, but I mean that's that's not up to me to decide. Uh, the evidence is as uh, as good as uh, um, perhaps even better than than for many other things that have been injected into the knees. So so Christian mentioned before that there perhaps is an actual active or physiological effect with saline injections. And I think there's been some studies on that. What, what do you think, Marius? Do you think it's inert or do you think there's, there might be an active ingredient per se within them? I think it's, um, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, until it has been proven by, uh, by some uh, clever immunologist or, or a bio, uh, biomedical researcher, I will stick to the, to, to the fact that it's not doing anything. Uh, and it's being washed out and absorbed very, very quickly. Uh, it is physiological saline, so so, uh, and it's only five milliliters. Uh, so so, I cannot really imagine it doing anything. But there are a few uh, minor experiments talking about uh, osmolarity and cell senescence and and various uh, advanced biomedical things. Um, but but one shot of five milliliters of of or, or even four shots every other week, one every other week for four weeks. I don't think we can see any biomedical or document any biomed biomedical or, or biological effects of anything. But I'm, not, I'm open for the fact that, uh, that there may be something, um, but, but until it's proven, I will stick to the fact that, that uh, so far it's inert. Mar Marius, a question on it, because you might have some insight. When these participants had the saline injections, did they see quick pain reductions or what was the, was it something that happened over a number of days or weeks or did they feel immediate relief? Uh, very variable. Uh, we, we don't see a relief on the, on the spot. It's not like you, you jump off the table and you're relieved, but, but uh, based on the data, we can see that it's within the first week of the, of the first shot, you, 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 the, the effects uh, kick in. And then this, the third, the second, the third and the fourth shot are, are more like a, a boosters. Um, but but um, we don't we do we don't have pain recordings just like just before and just after um, uh, not for that study at least. Um, no, it'd be interesting interesting look at. I'm going off on a tangent, but I mean we use shockwave occasionally for 
persistent tendinopathies and you see really quick pain reductions and I don't think it has the mechanisms that shockwave companies promote and others promote it has some sort of central mechanism I think probably why it reduces pain and maybe this is a similar process I don't know there's more cleverer people than me that maybe need to test these and, and look at it a bit more yep. so so can we can we can we go off topic a little bit uh gentlemen and and talk about this this review uh for exercise for hip and knee OA by I think Melanie Holden, which has come out uh, literally just yesterday. And it's okay if you haven't read it, it's all good. But if you have some other opinions on the role of exercise as a primary or core treatment for hip and knee osteoarthritis, so where are we at? For, for, for me, I'll put my bias, I'll put my, I'll declare my interest here. I say, I think exercise is a simple low hanging fruit cost effective minimal harm associated with it multiple secondary benefits associated with it it just it makes sense as a primary intervention so that's that's my bias i, I want to hear from you two gents we know that marius wants to give saline injections to everyone christian what do you reckon um i think from a pain perspective and i think marius's trial shows this well you can reduce pain many different ways so saline injection, manual therapy, we know that has a reduction in pain in the short term. There's a whole range of things and, and exercise the same and various types of exercise. But I think I haven't read the, the study. It was a slightly novel study looking at pulling a lot of data from different RCTs. So they won't have captured all the different RCTs available. So there may be some selection bias in those willing to share data and, and various things like that. I'm not sure. My quick scan of abstract from Twitter this morning in between doing some telehealth sessions was that there was varying non-exercise interventions. So I think they included some trials that would have no treatment. Other trials would have different education interventions or other usual care. So when we look at the effect, I think it'd be good to tease that out a bit more. I don't know if you've read in that level of detail, Jared, but I think going back to the point of the trials, when you compare exercise to no intervention, it seems that there's a moderate effect. Um, and of course, this the review from my reading briefly is that it showed a lower effect than that. So it might be that there's other non-exercise interventions that are compared from a pain perspective. But go, I, I declare my bias too, Jared, and it very much aligns with you is I think there's a lot of other benefits to exercise and it's a low-hanging fruit. And when I think about it, what I'm trying to achieve in my clinical practice, so GLAD aside, I put some people into GLAD because I think it's a great program for them. Others I don't send to GLAD because I think they need a slightly different approach. And I think that's important context of that clinical reasoning. And I'm trying to build their self-efficacy and I'm trying to reduce their fear of loading and fear of damage. And exercise to me is almost an extension of education a lot of times. So what we're actually doing with exercise, we're telling someone it's okay to move, it's okay to be active, it's okay to go for a walk, it's okay to load your knee and do a squat and do a lunge and do all these activities. And then we're taking them through the process of graded exposure to those exercises. So I think it has to be coupled, exercise has to be coupled with education to work well. And I think that's a really important part of it for me. Morris? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've contributed to this uh, review, so I have read it several times uh, over the last uh, couple of years, so I, I know the, de the details um, quite well. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that is important in that is that the, the, the trials that have contributed with data, so this is, this is the, not a, a standardized systematic review where you just pick the, the data from the articles. These are individual patient data. So, so all the authors of the individual trials have been invited to provide all data. And then uh, they only got a part of that. And then what you can spec only speculate why some people do not want to, to share the data. Is that because they don't have something to hide? Uh, they, they do have something to hide or are there other things that are preventing them from sharing data? But at the end, what the, 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 the studies that they got data from are of higher quality objectively seen when we look at the risk of bias in these studies. So, so I mean, the estimate from this study is probably more reliable than previous estimates. And then it is disappointingly low. So it's, it's on average 6.5 on a, on a zero to 100 scale. Uh, effect of exercise versus no attention on pain in the short term and even worse in the longer term so that's well, also uh, uh, an important aspect so so the so the the cart house is falling together for exercise in terms of a pain relieving mechanism and then i would have to say that i agree with the uh, with christian that there's so much more to exercise than pain relief and then and then it is uh, it is a means of of living healthy. So, so my bias is that I don't no longer believe in exercise as a pain relieving mechanism. 
one, because the, the, the evidence tells me it's not, and two, because I've not been presented with a biologically plausible mechanism of why is exercise causing less pain. I have, I have never understood that. But that's another discussion. And then I think we should we should uh, we should use exercise as, as a means to improve health and quality of life. I mean, uh, people with knee osteoarthritis are at a severely increased risk of getting cardiovascular disease. So we should you we should target that. That's a bigger problem than the knee pain because knee pain is not dangerous, but the the cardiovascular diseases are probably uh, more dangerous or are more dangerous. So we should target those problems and then the knee will come along. Yeah. Well, circle all the way back, Marius. That's one of the questions I had is, I guess, the reasoning of not including health-related quality of life or measures of physical activity in your trial. I'm not sure where, why that occurred or whether you had a conversation about it and just wanted to focus on pain, but that's something I've always been curious on. Well, the health-related quality of life... Uh... We, we do have the quality of life in, in the Coos questionnaire, so it's part of, part of it. Uh, measuring physical activity is, uh, is cumbersome and expensive, so it's also about uh, resources in our trial. Uh, and we have, looked, we have had a look uh, at physical activity before and after GLAD in other, in other studies showing it's not changing anything in physical activity. And yeah, we looked just... at that before and after weight loss, before and after knee replacement surgically, nothing really happened. So, so if you want to improve physical activity, you have to target that specifically and not by doing neuromuscular exercises that's my opinion at least so just for the benefits of the listeners the coos quality of life measure is more about knee confidence i think from my perspective whereas health related quality of life takes into account a lot more things around anxiety depression varying other health factors so i think they're quite different measures so i think one should be referred to as knee related quality of life which is coos the other is health related quality of life and i think that's an important distinguishment yeah i agree marius you said you said a moment ago that you no longer believe in exercise as a pain relieving or pain mitigating or pain reducing treatment. So if you were a clinician and someone came to you with knee osteoarthritis and they had a strong disposition or proclivity or preference to exercise, would you say, well, there is a small effect for exercise, right? Against no treatment. Maybe it's the same as other interventions, but there is a small effect in terms of pain relief. And it's up to the patient to decide whether that small effect is clinically important to them or not. So if somebody came to you and actually said, I want to exercise, it's your job as a clinician to say, perhaps, well, this is what the research says. Would you yield to them and say, okay, here's an exercise program? I'm sure you would, but run, run me through your clinical reasoning around that. Yeah, I would, I would uh, definitely not discourage them from exercising. Um, and, and, uh, if they want to exercise, I would, I would put them off to an exercise program that they find fun. So, so, and I say, this is not, this is for your greater well being, your greater health. It's, we should, we should put your knee a bit to the side here. Uh, you want to do exercise, you want to play, go back to play tennis or whatever, then we need to, to, uh, to make your, you make you into a a condition that is that allows that, and then uh, explaining them that knee osteoarthritis is something uh, that is that is there to to stay. It's not going to go away. We're going to manage this, um, and and you will have bad periods and good periods, uh, and and we have to dose the the exercise uh, to fit that. Um, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell them that I have the magical exercise here. And if you do this, you're free to go, and you will. We'll see you next year. Or, yeah. So so um, so I'm gonna. I'm, I would. I would take the more general health perspective. And and as Christian said, well, uh, empower people. I mean, that perhaps exercise is more of an empowerment tool than as a as a pain relieving mechanism. Uh, and uh, that's that would be my approach. So, so I think we are on the same page here, me and Christian. Christian, yeah, I think uh, going back, to, I don't think you can just tell someone to do exercise that's fun because that's often what gets them into trouble. So, if you say you just go do something fun, they're probably playing tennis and maybe overloading, and they don't have the capacity to do that. So, I think we actually do need to target the impairments that might be stopping them doing the fun part of exercise. And I think 
it's almost like a taking your medicine, addressing those impairments. Now, whether you use the program like GLAD or use some other form of exercise to target those impairments, um, it's going to depend on the person. So if they've got muscle weakness and loss of muscle power to be able to absorb loads through their quadriceps and break and, and not load their knee up too much, for running or for tennis or whatever it might be, or maybe there's hip muscle weakness that we need to address. We need to really tailor it and target it. So I think this whole, let's just do whatever exercise is fun, I think is a bit short-sighted for people. And I think our job as physios is to tailor it and, and target it. But with the end game being exactly what Maris is saying is getting them back to doing activity that's fun. So the end game for the, the tennis player that comes to me is going back to play tennis and playing tennis a couple of times a week or whatever they want to do. But along the way, they may, have, may need to take some exercise medicine, so to speak, and address some of their impairments. And I think if we go back to the concept of there's lots of pain relieving mechanisms that may be at play for various different interventions, we can use lots of things for pain, but if we do a saline injection and someone's lacking the muscle strength and power to be able to play tennis, we're probably not going to have a very good outcome. And I think our job as physios is to make sure that we address those impairments. And I think that's important. I speak about Maris's trial every single week with my patients because I think it's a really key and important message. And that is that you can actually get pain relief from many different mechanisms. And so what we need to do is individual your care and what we provide you based on what your goals are and, and set up a set up an intervention to help you with that. Maris, any yeah, no, thoughts? I, yeah, I would like to add that that uh, managing knee osteoarthritis or any musculoskeletal condition or any condition at all is not a, you either do this or this. I mean, you can do uh, pharmaceuticals and exercise and these can probably go well hand in hand some, in some patients. If you reduce the pain, then you can get through with your muscle strengthening exercises. Um, or if you reduce a, an acute inflammatory response or if you get an, a relief from, a, from another procedure, and then you can, you can go on with your physio. Uh, so, so we shouldn't think this as you only have to do this and nothing else. I mean, the co-interventions are very important, but the, the body of evidence in support of, of the combinations are, are not there. There are too few studies on, 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 on synergistic um, uh, ways of, of looking at this. In, in the short term, combining education and exercise, the evidence is not super clear, but it's pretty clear that that combination is probably better than doing either alone. And we have some systematic reviews that we've published recently around that space. But and the ed, point is, the education interventions can be a lot better as well. They're not very well defined. What, what do we what do we make of exercise being superior to corticosteroid injections into the knee for knee osteoarthritis, or or physical therapy which included exercise? What do we make of that study which was published a, a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine? Anyone got well, any I have to start. Yeah, that was not only just exercise. That was exercise, yeah. and then and then uh, they uh, they were allowed to do anything else that the physio find found uh, relevant. So, yeah. so it's more like a physiotherapy uh, toolbox versus the the injection thing uh, that came out. But but yes, that's that's kind of the, the arrow points in the other direction than, than our studies and latest other studies. Um, I mean, I also showed that combination of, of a steroid injection followed by exercise versus saline injections follow exercise some years back. And uh, there were no difference between the placebo and saline and, and steroids. So that kind of kicked off the debate about steroid injections. And then now uh, physiotherapy is superior to steroid injections. And now uh, saline is equivalent to, ex I mean, Everything is a mess and probably just a sign that that uh, it's all polluted by contextual factors and and and, uh, and cognitive bias and, and 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 also because we we use uh, pain as an outcome and that is uh, subjective and really really uh, affected by so many things that are out of our control. Christian, any, so, any so wise words? We're, we're back to square one. We don't know what to I, do. So. <laughs> I, I, I agree with Marius in that um, pain is, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, <laughs> Marius didn't use these words, but it's a very simplistic way of looking at things. And I think it's, from my perspective, it's a bit short sighted and we need to think about things a little bit more holistically and about the person's general health and well being, health related quality of life physical activity, participation, there's a whole range of things we need to consider around that. And I think we need to target our interventions towards many things. Um, and testing that sort of thing in a clinical trial is really challenging. 
Um, but we have to go to the real world. And as clinicians, our responsibility is to do similar to what we do with GLAD. And I go back to the point I made at the beginning. It's not a recipe program. It is actually a minimal intervention. It's a framework to start with. It's not just about the knee control. It's about providing varying exercises to address impairments and tailoring it and targeting to the individual. And if you do that well, you typically get reasonable outcomes. Not everyone benefits. So if I go to our GLAD registry data, we see three quarters of people would have a clinically meaningful change in their pain or quality of quality of life. So that means one in four don't have any benefit from doing the program. So our challenge going forward is to work out who those one in four are and how we can look at them a bit differently. And maybe we can change it. And looking at the whole population, how do we get them all physically active? Because the other thing I can share with the listeners is that we only see a small, very modest effect on physical activity across the board when we use a program like GLAD. We need to, a lot more behavior change. And that's something we're working on in the background at the moment. So hopefully I'll be able to chat to you about that one day, Jared, in the future. Looking forward to it. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you, uh, gents, before we finish off here. It's late for you, Christian, and I don't know. Is it uh, what time is it? It's over noon. There? Noon. Time for an afternoon nap for you, Marius. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask you both to to prophesy something here and say, are we ever gonna find something that at scale has moderate to large effects for hip and knee osteoarthritis? or really any musculoskeletal pain whatsoever? Um, or are we always going to run into this ceiling effect that people are so individual and pain is so complex and individual that everyone's always going to respond differently to every single intervention, you know? So I'm not saying we shouldn't continue with clinical trials. I absolutely do think we should, but are we going to find this magic intervention that's going to scale and, and help everyone to a moderate or large degree? Uh, I really hope so, uh, but I have to, to be pessimistic and say, well, probably not in my lifetime, which is uh, hopefully um, <laughs> long. <laughs> um, Another hundred years to but, go. But I, but, I, but I also have to say that, um, and I always tease um, the medical doctors about this, that as long as when, 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 peop when doctors refer to physiotherapy, it's because they don't know what to do. I mean, if they had the pill, they would give it, but they don't. And and I mean, we as physios, uh, it's it's unfortunate that, that that we are left with all those uh, difficult cases. I mean, look at low back pain, knee osteoarthritis, hip osteoarthritis, uh, shoulder pain of various uh, reasons. Nobody knows what's going on, and they just send it off to us, and then they criticize us for not working uh, uh, scientifically, and yada yada yada. I mean, so so we have the the tough ones. So I hope that someday some smart doctor will will find that cure and and put be very rich, um, uh, and then uh, we we can focus on on some other patients. Yeah. My my short answer, Jared, for everybody, absolutely not. We won't find it because it's too complex, and belief systems are too complex, and society and cultures is too complex. And there's always going to be people who don't respond to different interventions. But quality education and a quality tailored targeted exercise program is always a pretty good starting point, point. Um, and that could be done in various different ways. Glad being one option, but there's many other options as well. And I think that's an important message for listeners. There's lots of lots of varying options we have available. So if one exercise program doesn't work doesn't mean that another one may not so just keep keep exploring the toolbox and don't escalate your care too quickly into potential things that are harmful and i think marius's point earlier first do no harm is a really key one and i think that that we also need to i mean it's it's probably a more profound cultural thing that people are not really ready to accept to live in with pain of, of any kind so so uh I think we should educate people, the, the population, that pain in your body, muscle or cellular system is part of life. Uh, you're not going to go through your life without having pain for periods of life. And, and uh, unfortunately, osteoarthritis uh, is for the latter part of your life. And it, uh, we become older and older, so probably you will have to deal with this for many years. Um, but it's not dangerous. It's not going to kill you. Uh, you just have to uh, figure a way to be to be in it and live with it and manage it as, as good as you can. Christian, any 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 last words? No, that's a that's a that's a great message to finish on. Is we do need to accept pain is part of life. Um, that's how we conceptualize it and what we let it stop us doing and make sure we continue to be active and look after ourselves. Pain is life.
That's going to be the the headline of today's podcast. All right, it's profound. Life is philosophical. Pain. Oh. <laughs> Life is pain. Whichever way you want to go. <laughs> all right, gents. Thanks so much. Uh, you both shown courage and bravery coming on here and and having a chat and and uh, declaring all your biases. And I really respect you both. So thank you so much. And I'm sure everyone will get something out of it. Cheers, fellas. Well, thank you for having us, and thank you for the for the discussion, uh, Christian. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jared, and thank you for answering my many questions, Marius.